sisters in terms of their residential location choices or their transportation choices. Um, okay, how do I get through all this? Got it, right? Okay, great. Um, there are um, you know, more people in urbanized areas. We talked about that. And uh, we have an aging population, not just in the US, but all over the world. And again, today I'm going to be talking about aging population and their travel outcomes. And uh, today, and today's talk is based on a recent research uh, paper that we published um, on older adults and determinants of sustainable mobility. And this paper was co-authored with one of my former doctoral students, Basha Rosbilan, and my colleagues at Ohio State University and H. Brandy Columbus. So um, you may have already heard, or you may have already uh, read about this. Um, the um, in terms of the population, by 2050, we are expecting the population, we are expecting the uh, population of older individuals to double by 2050 worldwide. Um, and transportation is one of the critical components to cater to this population change. Because we're expecting such a huge increase in um, older adults, um, the World Health Organization launched the Global Age Friendly Cities and Communities Project. And this is really leading research and activities in terms of catering to older individuals. When we look at an age-friendly city, there are eight pillars that support an age-friendly city. And as I mentioned before, transportation is a key component here. Um, transportation not only is a key component, but it also interacts with other components, such as housing, outdoor space, community support, health services, uh, to support age-friendly cities. Um, lack of mobility not only affects access to destinations, but also results in depression and uh, social isolation for older individuals. So um, coming to US, the picture in US, right now about 16% of the population is above the age of 65. And based on the estimates, based on the forecast of Center for uh, Disease Control, um, by 2030, we are going to have 70 million older adults um, in our population. That corresponds to about a little over 20% of the population, which means one in every five individuals will be 65 and above at, by the uh, year 2030. The current data shows that about 90% of older individuals are getting to their destinations by, by uh, privately owned vehicles. So we have an aging population, but are we planning for it? The answer is overall is uh, we're not planning for it at an overall comprehensive way. So there may be projects or initiatives at local levels or different levels, but we are not we are lacking a comprehensive approach in terms of dealing with um, an aging population, especially in the U.S. because our land use patterns really cater towards cars. As soon as older individuals are no longer able to drive then they are isolated in their homes. They have difficulty getting to their destinations. Uh, most importantly, they're even uh, missing their medical appointments because of this. Um, so uh, these were, this was some background to tell you about why we were interested in aging population and why we decided to uh, look into their transportation needs and some of the um, current patterns. So um, older adults travel behavior is affected by the similar usual suspects when it comes to travel behavior. So social demographics such as age, gender, employment, lifestyle related factors, health status, and built environment characteristics, they all affect the travel behavior of older adults, which is not different from uh, the rest of the population. Um, I would say from a planning perspective, the third category, built environment characteristics, would be the most important to focus for us because that's the place that we can make interventions and we can make changes uh, to individuals' lives. So in this study, we focused on three questions. We wanted to find out what built environment characteristics are associated with older adults' travel outcomes. Uh, we wanted to understand whether there are age cohort specific effects, because when we look at older adults, uh, there are cohorts within that group as well. 
And what can we do as planners to uh, meet the needs of older individuals? The study, I don't know if I can close this and should be okay, right? Okay. Um, the data comes uh, from the Columbus metropolitan area um, and Columbus, um, for, for those of you who have not visited Columbus before, a lot of people think Columbus is a small city, a college town. That's not the case. That's, uh, Columbus is the 14th most populous city in the US. Um, it's, it's a medium sized city, just like quite a few other medium sized cities in the Midwest. Uh, there's a um, highly connected highway network, um, but when it comes to transit and facilities for bicycles and walking, we significantly lack, uh, Columbus significantly lacks those facilities. Uh, based on the American Community Survey, um, Central Ohio residents who are above the age of 50 makes up about 30% of the population. And based on the forecast of Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, uh, Central Ohio is expecting to double the population of those who are um, ages who are aged 65 and older. So, um, because of these uh, large expected large increases in aging population, the authorities, namely the City of Columbus, um, uh, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission, they launched the Age Friendly Columbus and Franklin County Franklin County Initiative in 2016. And this initiative works with cities and other organizations to improve the lives of older residents. So they work to increase the walkability of sidewalks and streets. They empower older adults uh, to prepare their homes for a safely aging, uh, aging in place. They work with city officials to create knowledge base for these individuals. So they do quite a few projects working with older adults and city organizations. And the primary data for this study actually comes from one of their projects. They collected data in 2016 uh, from older adults aged 50 and above. Um, and the survey had about 1,200 valid responses. And the survey asked um, a broad uh, base of information from the survey respondents. So the survey was not only based on transportation, uh, but we use the mostly the transportation part for our research purposes. Um, the survey included information about individual and household characteristics, transportation mode choices for different activities, and also uh, built environment characteristics around respondents' household locations. So the built environment part uh, gave us a little, um, gave us some limitations. The survey has perceived built environment information where they ask uh, individuals whether they think they are, there are safe routes to parks around their homes, whether uh, sidewalk conditions around their homes are in good shape or not. So most of the information in the um, survey data is perceived data. Um, that's why we decided to bring some objective uh, measures to the analysis, but that's where we use the EPA smart location database. Um, the survey asked individuals their zip code. So unfortunately, we did not have an address information. We only had the zip code, which is quite an aggregate level for this type of study, but that was the only thing we had. So um, we were able to bring some built environment variables as control at the zip code level using environmental protection agency smart location database so and before we move forward i also would like to talk about what we really focused on and how we created the outcome variable we were interested in the travel outcomes of older individuals and we were specifically interested in the mode of choice um, of older individuals um, the survey asked individuals about their mode choice for different activities, different uh, destinations, and they had the option to select multiple modes. So we categorized individuals into three groups. Auto users would be the ones who would only use auto as a driver or a passenger to get to their destinations. Non-auto users would be the ones who would use transit, bicycle, or walk to their destinations. And multimodal, I think the name implies, would uh, use auto and other modes to get to their destination. So we have three possible outcomes for individuals. We use the multinomial logistic model uh, to understand the associations between our key variables and the outcomes. 
And the key variables we focused on are um, age-related and built environment characteristics. And of course, we brought in control variables, variables that are known to affect travel outcomes to make sure that we are measuring the effects of built environment and age correctly. So um, the key variables, looking at the um, variables that we're focusing on, I'm not going to go over um, every single cell and talk about the numbers, just a few observations uh, based on the descriptive statistics to give you an idea about how the sample looked like. The sample had um, over 80% identified as auto users. So as you can see, non-auto users and multimodal uh, travelers are about six to 9%. And looking at the age distribution, we created cohorts, uh, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and then 70 plus. And we find that most of the individuals in the survey data, in the survey sample, um, are between the ages of 60 to 69. And then, but we still have a good distribution of individuals in other age groups as well. Um, as I mentioned, the survey had uh, questions about perceived built environment variables. And we use these two in our final models because the others, they either had very few responses or they did not turn out to be statistically significant. So the ones that we focused on was whether there are parks that are well maintained uh, close to their residential location and uh, whether there are safe crosswalks um, around their residential location. So looking at the control variables, we again, as I mentioned, we brought in the variables that we know that affect travel outcomes to measure our key variables effects correctly. And uh, one, so we had gender, race, income, employment status, and one um, variable that I would like to highlight is the health status. So in the survey sample, only about 12% rated their health status as poor or fair. So over 75% rated their health status as good or very good or excellent, which may imply that individuals not walking is not really related to their health status. It may be related to really other factors. So health status is not the main issue specifically for the sample that hinders the walking or biking or taking transit um, options. We estimated two models, one without interactions using the raw variables and one with interactions. And the specific interaction we were focused on was built environment factors and age. And as I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes, we found that proximity to crosswalks with countdown uh, is the only one that really changes across the age categories. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So um, looking at the model estimation results uh, without the interaction effects. Um, so again, uh, this is a multinomial logic. So we have a base case. So there are three outcomes, being an auto user, being a multimodal user, and being a non-auto user. Auto user is set as the base case. So we are looking at the effects of these certain variables on, becoming, on making an individual become a non-auto user or a multimodal traveler. We report the relative risk ratios, which if the relative risk ratio is less than one, then the effect uh, increases the probability. So if it is less than one, the uh, variable decreases the probability of becoming, uh, let's say a non-auto user, one of uh, the outcome variable. If it is more than one, then the variable increases the probability of being in that outcome category. So for instance, looking at this very first one, uh, as compared to those who are between the ages of 50 to 59, being in the age of 60 to 69 would be only 30% as likely to be in the non-auto user category. So I think the easy way to look at this is if the effect is, if the relative risk ratio is about one, then the likelihood of being in that category increases. And if it's less than one, then the likelihood decreases. So um, looking at the age categories specifically, we find that as age increases, being a non-auto user, the probability of being a non-auto user decreases. And this is statistically significant for 60 to 69. It is not for 70 or more, but it's still close by at the 10% level. It's right at the border. So increasing age means that uh, individuals are going to be non 
individuals are going to be less likely to be non-auto users. Um, looking at having access to parks within walking distance, I think this is a powerful result. Uh, having access to parks within walking distance significantly increases the probability of using multiple modes as compared to being just an auto user. And again, uh, another powerful result, having access to crosswalks with countdowns increases the probability of being a non-auto user or a multimodal traveler. So um, looking at the land use mix and transit uh, frequency of transit, these are coming from the EPA's location database. We find that uh, both land use mix and frequency of transit increases the probability of being a multimodal traveler or a non -auto, being a non-auto user. So um, looking at the interaction effects between age and crosswalks with countdowns, we find that for individuals who are 70 plus, they really prefer crosswalks with countdowns. So they having crosswalks with countdowns significantly increases the probability of being a non-auto user or a multimodal traveler for those who are 70 or above as compared to the other older age groups. So um, we can go back to these model results if there are detailed questions. Um, but at the, end of, at the end of the study, we find that age and built environment characteristics are associated with travel outcomes of older individuals. And uh, we also find that aging may not cause a transition from auto to other travel modes. There are also discussions about, well, if the drivers or if the older adults are having health issues and they cannot drive anymore, they will automatically switch to other modes. Uh, we do not, we're not finding um, an effect to that um, suggestion, to that proposed um, idea. So um, looking at planning implications, I think there are quite a few significant results that come from this study. We find that uh, providing countdown timers on crosswalks to allow enough time to cross for older individuals is a key for, for them to feel safe crossing and that will affect their likelihood of becoming multimodal users or non-auto users. Um, improving access to parks, of course, this is not just for older adults, it affects everyone. In having safe access to parks will increase everyone's uh, probability of using alternative modes. And uh, designing urban environments with higher levels of uh, land use mix and higher frequency transit services will all affect older individuals' likelihood of uh, using other modes. So, um, of course, this study was done uh, based on data before the COVID-19 pandemic. So the data is based on uh, the surveys that were collected in 2016, which was before COVID-19. And COVID-19 brought quite a few changes to our travel behavior, how we behave, our out-of-home activities, remote working, online shopping, and so on. So, um, of course, the study does not, um, that does not include any effects related to a pandemic. And this is, a, this is an analysis of um, online shopping, for instance, and how it relates to different age groups. So the green uh, bars are uh, data from 2009, and the dark blue ones are data from 2017. And for each age group, age cohort, we are seeing an increase in online shopping going from 2009 to 2017. And this was, again, before COVID. So if we include COVID, probably the jumps are going to be even higher. Um, but what I would like to also stress here is the jump in the 65 to 74 group is higher than the other groups. Although the percentages, overall percentages may be in the lower brackets, the jump going from 18% to 14%, for, sorry, 44% is quite a big jump. And uh, the reports that we are reviewing are telling us that this trend is accelerating and continuing for the older age groups. So again, um, this is just to have a discussion about the fact that this study did not include any COVID-19 related uh, changes that may be brought about to our lifestyle. And we know that COVID-19 did not affect everyone in the same way, not just the age cohorts, but different age cohorts, different social demographic groups, uh, different uh, income levels, so it will be great uh, to replicate the study after the pandemic and see if the 
um, outcomes if the findings still hold true or, uh, or not? And if not, what would be some of the effects of COVID-19 and how we can incorporate them into uh, planning processes uh, moving forward? So um, with this, I'm going to conclude this talk and open it up for conversation. Questions from everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna let the people online know that they can submit their questions online and I'll read them out. But are there questions in the audience? Carly. Good one. Um, I'm curious the finding of the, the, the countdown, the crossing countdowns. Um, I wonder if you've had any conversations with the city about their strategies for where they those, and if there might be some correlation. Right, right. Because if if, if, if we know that those are well, especially for older adults who might be walking more slowly. Um, it'd be really, it'd be interesting to see sort of how those are deployed within that, that side of the planning. So um, we did not have any specific conversations about how they chose the specific locations, but we see them just from observation in downtown areas more as compared to like more suburban um, areas. Um, so I don't know, um, if there would be a correlation between older adults living in those areas versus not. So of course, one of the limitations of the study is we do not uh, account for residential self-selection. If individuals are choosing locations upfront that cater towards their transportation needs or not. So that's one of the limitation. Um, but I think since the individuals are coming from all over Columbus in the study, they're not from specific locations, specific communities. I think that affects uh, will probably be eliminated. I don't think there will be a correlation between outcomes and, um, you know, outcomes and where the locations are. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't know, Christy, you do want to manage the... Yeah, I'll moderate. <laughs> Thank you. I have two questions. First of all, thank you for your much talk. The first one is, you said that after you study, you get like some Proposals, for example, let's reduce the that the intervals between the buses coming to, to pick up the people, for example. Do you have any way to model that policies to make decisions on them or how is it implemented? The decisions that you make. So as researchers, and um it's not really specific to this study, but it, but in general, as researchers, we basically take the data and model how the current um, you know, behavior, how the current outcomes are being played out, right? So we can look at the factors going in, factors coming and the outcomes coming out. And then we inform the officials in terms of recommendations. So as researchers, we cannot really go out and change the countdown uh, timers or, you know, specific bus stops and so on, but we can have conversations with city uh, managers, city officials, so that next time they're making these decisions, uh, they make some more informed decisions. So this study was done uh, with me and my doctoral student and also age friendly Columbus. So they have incorporated some of the findings that came from the study for their, to the, to their strategic plan moving forward. It's a quick question. Have you studied, like for example, in the COVID-19 abusive situation, how are the mobility patterns, patterns affect the spread of the disease? That, you know, there are some studies like that. Mobility patterns and spread of the disease, for example, in COVID. So I haven't really looked at, I'm, I'm not really uh, an epidemiologist, obviously, so uh, I haven't really looked at that. But I have done some studies in terms of risk perceptions and COVID-19 and people's behavior. And what we found was, and Christy knows that study, what we found was, uh, especially in the earlier, earlier stages of pandemic, people were really wary about taking public transportation and using other shared modes, such as shared bicycles and, and so on. So they really wanted to be on their in their car or they wanted to use their own bicycle or a walk, if this is a walking or a bikeable destination. I think we're seeing shifts towards uh, going back to normal, especially after people got vaccinated, we had masks and we knew more about COVID-19 and how to protect from that. Then we saw some uh, shifts going backwards to norm normality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
But I don't know if there if there are any studies looking at whether people were more likely to get um, COVID if they were riding the bus versus others. I mean, there are studies on the perceptions, but I don't know if there are studies on the actual outcomes. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I'm interested in how this uh, study um, actually informed policy decisions in the global south, given that they have a different kind of edge structure as well. They use that the majority and they are not an actual how then can the global south is this particular kind of study informing the policy of so um if I'm understanding correctly, <laughs> um you're saying in global south older adults make a smaller portion of the population. Yeah. Yeah. And so how then can we borrow this kind of this inform policy? So I think in terms of applicability of this study, I don't think you can take a study from uh, mid uh, Ohio and then apply it to, let's say, uh, South Africa. I don't think you can do that directly. But the uh, uh, process that went into this study, the surveys and so on, could be replicated. And even though the older adults may uh, be making a smaller percentage of the community in uh, global South, they are still important and we still want to cater for them. We want them to be a part of the community. And the other thing is, if we are able to provide these uh, policy or planning implications for older adults, they will benefit the whole society as well, right? So if we have better uh, sidewalks, if we have uh, better crosswalks or access to parks, it's not going to only affect older individuals, it's going to affect and benefit everyone. So before, before we go to another question here, I've got a question online and kind of alternate. We've got a few questions. Chris Nelson first says, this is a very thought-provoking study. So thank you for that. <laughs> I wonder if you found differences in patterns with respect to race and income. Maybe you did earlier, but his remote access cut out and he may not have heard of race and income correlations. So um, we looked at race and income and the correlations, but we did not see um, implication. We didn't see statistically significant results in this study. The reason for that could be uh, in terms of the race distribution and the size of the survey, uh, the, the numbers were on the smaller side. So if we have a smaller side and if we're thinking about significant um, statistically significant coefficients, it's difficult to get those effects when the sample, especially the um, different races um, are distributed. When the different races are distributed, we have smaller samples when it comes to, let's say, African-Americans or Hispanics and so on. So I think there would be considerations and there would be um, uh, differences. Maybe if we had a larger sample, we would be able to observe them. And uh, the same with income, I would say. So uh, the income distribution on the sample, um, I believe if, um, more than 50% was making about 60, 65, more than 60, 65. So we didn't have, um, we didn't have a good enough distribution to capture all the income differences. But um, if you look at the literature, um, looking at the race and how the aging effects are observed, we see that low-income individuals and um, African-Americans, Hispanics, they actually start seeing aging effects earlier, and that could be related to the jobs they may be working, the lifestyle that they have been living, if they had more difficult lives versus, uh, you know, if they had higher incomes, um, health insurance, how, how much they were able to take care of their um, health. We see differences in terms of what age or what ages we start observing aging um, effects. I saw a hand in the far corner. Uh, my question was, uh, can we introduce the intersection of the population? Did we? Can we determine whether the person across the street? So I can calculate, well, that's from the time of the So we can. Well, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. I don't think. Um, I don't think that was considered at the time of the survey. So I think the only question that was asked was uh, whether there are crosswalks with countdown signals um, around your household residence. But that's a fantastic uh, idea. And we talked about basically marrying the idea of catering to everyone and technology 
And that would be a great use of technology in this case. Going back online, Gretchen Lur asks, um, or, or, or brings her question first. Uh, for many non-auto users, they are reliant on others for their trips and errands. Mass transport for older adults with mobility impairments is fragmented and unreliable. Um, how can this work inform a more connected network so that isolation and barriers to access can be mitigated? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> And I think there is not a one size fits all type of answer to this, because depending on the urban structure, whether we are talking about a somewhat isolated suburban uh, neighborhood versus an urban neighborhood, I think the answers would be different. And I think there will be a combination of solution strategies that could work. So I think in certain neighborhoods, maybe having on-demand services that could lead to transit could be an excellent idea which we have some of it that's going, uh, that's on the testing phase right now in Atlanta. We have on-demand services that are catering, that are feeding into Marta. Um, in certain neighborhoods, it could be that these on-demand services uh, take individuals from their origins to destinations directly because of lack of transit. And in certain locations, it could be that uh, if it's dense enough, if the sidewalks uh, cater towards older individuals and their needs, they can simply be on transit. Maybe they may need a little bit of help getting on, but still they can use transit system directly. Great question, Gretchen. Daniel, is that Yeah, so I had two questions. One's more methodological. Like, how do you treat like self-reported income among this population? And like, how accurate do you think it is? Well, I think that's the caveat with, with a lot of other surveys that we uh, use, right? So we basically um, take it as it is. So we ask about the household income and whatever they report, we, we take it as it is. So when we were cleaning the data, if they didn't report anything or if they reported quite large incomes, like you know more than 20 million and so on, we, we basically got rid of those data. But in general, again, just like with any other survey, we take it as it is. And then my other question is like, what, what from your like interpretation of your results, do you have like an indication of what is motivating people to, particularly among the non-auto using group? Like what's motive, is it recreation? Is it trying to stay healthy? Is it kind of necessity? I mean, it's difficult with like the lack of income data. We'll get like, you know, whether or not they, they need to walk because they don't have a car or reliable access to transportation. Well, that's an excellent question, but we did, we weren't able to get to that with this data. But I think it's, again, looking, if you look at the literature, it's a combination, right? Especially with COVID, people really understood the importance of physical activity, right? So with that, people started walking or biking more. So part of it is really recreation, but then having destinations within walkable um, distances is also important, right? Getting to a coffee shop or getting to a friend's house. And then, of course, part of it is necessity. If you don't have access to an auto or if the person uh, cannot ride transit because of different reasons, then they would be choosing to walk. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a combination of all. And I think it's a great question, which uh, may be a topic for another paper that I'm thinking right now. <laughs> Fruitful area. Yes. I have a, another question online. Um, online is very Okay. Uh oh, <laughs> uh, we will not get through all the questions. If I see there's more here too. Um, from and I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, Minju Kim, hi. I'm wondering why you chose the evening peak hour for the frequency of transit. I feel older adults might travel more non peak hour with more flexible schedules. Um, and if they don't work any, or if they don't work any, or if they're retired, does EPA provide non peak hour information for the frequency of transit as well? So I don't have the answer to that question on top of my head, but if um, if Minji can uh, connect with me after this, if she uh, Minji can send me an email, I'll make sure to find the answer to that question. Uh, the reason I cannot recall is we used we looked at uh, quite a few um, data data points from the EPA Smart Location database, and I cannot recall why we did not use. Um, a different time frame for the frequency, whether that did not turn out to be um, statistically significant or they simply didn't have, I cannot recall, but I can answer that. Okay. Afterwards. So Minju Kim, please, please respond to Grusha uh, online with their email address. And for all the students, just in case you haven't seen it, the Smart Location Database is publicly available. So something to look into. And I think on the very end, 
my question uh, I wonder if you extracted some patterns so you can tell us more about whether the general needs that that, that population might have in terms of mobility. What are the usual treats that they do or you know like different uh conclusions that we observe uh from people uh done that are not in that age group. So um, this survey didn't really have those questions in terms of what, what their needs are or what types of trips that they're finding difficult to fulfill. Uh, but again, if you look at the literature, uh, there is a variety of, um, there are variety of reasons that older individuals or disabled individuals um, at the same time um, are finding difficulty to get to their destinations. Uh, we did some preliminary surveys in Marysville, which is not Columbus, Ohio, but Marysville, Ohio. And we asked older individuals in terms of what types of trips they're having difficulty fulfilling and, and which ones would they prioritize. And their trips to medical services would be the first one that they would need help with and they would prioritize. So the employment related ones, um, I think that was not prioritized. The reason for that, I think, people who are still employed are probably on the a little younger uh, spectrum of the distribution of age. And if they're employed, it may be that they have the means to drive a car, maybe the um, employment, um, maybe the employee is providing access. So um, employment was not the top, but the top one was access to medical services and also social events. Because I think again, with COVID, we realized that if we don't have access to transportation and if we cannot socialize, that has some tremendous effects on our psychology. Definitely saw that. So Nate Dyer online asks, what would you recommend as a way to plan for sustainable mobility in more rural communities, especially for rural communities that have higher amounts of seniors aging in? So I think, again, um, I don't have experience in rural planning, but again, there is not a one solution fits all type of approach. For rural communities, again, access is important. Having destinations that are within walkable distances. I know that transit, having transit service will be very difficult in rural communities because of lack of density that would support a transit service. But having some on-demand vehicles that would actually shuttle around the rural community or even maybe bring them to a nearby city from time to time to socialize would be fantastic for older adults. And of course, those on-demand services, if they can take older individuals to um, priority destinations such as medical care, uh, would also be um, a great approach. Okay. So thanks again for coming here. Appreciate it. And then do you think that survey captured any respondents who had no choice but to walk? And if not, how do you redo the survey so that you have everyone in that population that doesn't have a choice and then see what really matters to them for their propensity to one? So I think that's an excellent question. And with each survey, we're learning about, you know, how we ask questions differently or what other information should be collected. So I just wanted to say that this, this survey was collected by Age Friendly Columbus. And it's a, it's, it was a comprehensive survey asking about their health and other issues. Transportation was only a part of it. And we became involved with the project after the fact. So after the data was collected. So I think if I were designing the survey, then I would be asking people if they have access to a vehicle, if they have access to transit, um, you know, then, then I think we can capture captive drivers or captive walkers uh, better moving forward. Yeah, I just had a question for this, these age cohorts, what would a, do you have an idea of what a walkable distance would be? Uh, just thinking about planning with, in our practice, we plan kind of larger age restricted communities. So having an understanding of you know, how far is a walkable distance is really important. So I was curious if you had any idea about that. So, um, I think a walkable distance will depend on age and also physical ability because some people, even if they may be younger, they may not have the physical ability as compared to an older individual. But in general, in, um, in, in studies, when we think about a walkable distance, 
they generally take about quarter of a mile or half a mile. But it also depends whether this is going to be a walk, just a recreational walk, or is it an everyday occurring walk to, let's say, your job, right? So you may be willing to walk one mile today because the weather is nice. You just finished up your classes, but walking one mile every day to school may not be very feasible uh, for, for someone, right? So I think that uh, walkable, acceptable walkable distance changes from person to person, age to age. But in, again, in planning, we generally take it about half a mile or a quarter of a mile. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity as host, my privilege, to ask the last question. But I would like to say that Gretchen Lerr uh, just posted, I'm glad that you acknowledge that the older adult population is not a monolith. Uh, I wonder if it's worth going a bit more granular in terms of categories, just a thought. It's directly related to functional ability. Um, and my last question is, is partly also, so this um, lecture is co-hosted with the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning and the Civil Engineering Lecture Series. We have lots of students, um, both in person and, and online joining us. And there's, um, although the work that you did was so interesting and, and relative to Columbus and, and the topic, um, there seems to be a lot of areas to potentially grow in terms of research opportunities and practice mm -hmm. and projects. So I'm hoping that you can give our students some words of inspiration or direction in areas that you think would be deeply valuable for practice and for research moving forward in this topic. Yeah. So um, thank you. That's an excellent question and a great uh, closing remark, I think. So I think as planners, landscape architects, uh, civil engineers, we are really trying to create cities that are livable, right? So that are livable, sustainable, resilient. So with that, um, we need to think about everyone in the community, right? So we cannot just uh, plan for plan for a cohort that's 30 year old, uh, working, um, having financial means. We need to think about everyone. Uh, we need to think about uh, challenges others may be perceiving in terms of the built environment and um, try to cater to everyone. So when we are thinking about the critical infrastructure, when we are looking, uh, when we are making choices about school location, hospital location, we need to think about how people are going to access these facilities. So um, I think moving forward, we need to think about cities as a whole, cities as complex systems, think about our decisions, because one decision will definitely have implications for further decisions. So we need to understand how city systems work so we can design better moving forward. Well, I wanna thank you Kush, for coming. It's an excellent presentation. And thank you for handling our rapid fire discussion. <laughs> so thank you, Guta. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for hosting me. Well, I'm hoping everybody, whether you're online or in person, can join us for lunch. We bought literally hundreds of dollars worth of sandwiches in the Underwood Garden just downstairs. <laughs> um, so please, please stay for a few minutes, talk to Guta in the garden, enjoy the day, join us down there. Thank you for coming. I no,